OK. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is my talk. Uh, my name is Francis Wong. My talk is Testing Heresies. Um, this is, this is a, a Byzantine mosaic of St. Augustine fighting the heretic. Apparently, I wasn't wearing any pants. Um, uh, and now I want to talk about testing. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know up front, if you don't do a lot of testing and don't see the value of it, this is not a talk that will try to convince you of the value of it. Uh, there's plenty of talks you could see or things you could read about that. This, ta this talk is about how testing has been adopted and evangelized inside of our community, largely with Rails, but you know, with Ruby as well. There's a lot of sort of overlap. It's going to assume a good amount of Rails knowledge for you. Um, but it's kind of about testing in general. Um, and it, and uh, yeah, but you know, in case there's any doubt, I, I love testing. We, it's a great thing that we're doing it. I have some qualms with the way we've been talking about it. Let me tell you where I'm coming from so you can sort of get a sense of the context of, of how I see the world and the experiences I've had. I've been programming mostly the web for more than 10 years. I have never written life critical code, which is to say I've never had to worry about someone getting killed by a bug that I pushed out in production. That's probably most of you. But if you are writing life critical code, I don't know how applicable all this is to you. I've written mo my code mostly in agile context. And people have told me many times, I guess this is bragging, but that when I'm writing in simple and stable domains, my code is very clean. I've, I've been complimented on that a couple of times, which means I get thrown at the stuff that's harder. I get thrown at domains that are complex, and I get thrown at domains that change over time, which is going to inform a lot of what I'm talking about now. So, you know. <clears throat> Heresies are counterpoints to dogmas, right? Dogmas are sort of beliefs that communities hold on to, sometimes against logic, or sometimes they don't brook discussion, sometimes they don't want to hear them challenged, so that's sort of the point. This is the first one I'm going to start with. Testing in Rails is easy because we have fixtures. This one is a bit of a straw man, so I didn't really bother writing a heresy for it. But, you know, if you've, probably a lot of you have already been through this, but basically, this is your basic fixtures file. It's a YAML configuration file that set up stuff like in your users table, whatever. The, it works fine in your like one page blog post telling your Rails newbie how to like test, but as soon as shit gets hard, then all of a sudden your user YAML file is a goddamn mess, and you're like, why is Tom, who had to ban Susan for making comment two in this file when it has nothing to do, I don't know who Tom is in my test. Right. Now, Rails deserves a tremendous amount of credit with getting a lot of people to be better in their habits. You know, I don't want to take anything away from DHH's marketing efforts. I don't want to take anything away from Rails cores or the whole movement. But I do think there's a difference between sort of essential complexity and, and accidental complexity. Right? And I do think you do a disservice sometimes to people when you tell them, oh, this stuff's easy, and they believe you, then they jump in. And so I see this in the New York City group, people show up to our hackfest all the time and they're like, I don't know what's wrong. I must be using fixtures wrong. And then you have to tell them again and again, no, fixtures suck and you were lied to. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the dogma. This is the dogma. Testing is easy. It's not easy. It's hard, but that's okay. Easy jobs don't pay that well. Right. That's, that's the thing. It's hard, but it's worth doing anyway. Right? Our, we, we have serious jobs. There's money involved, right? I mean, for mel most of us, I would imagine, these days, right? So, so, you know, let's be a little professional. Not professional in terms of us having to wear suits and ties, you know, but professional in terms of actually taking this on. If this is an essentially hard problem, let's treat it like that. Let's be adults. So here's a dogma. With tests, I can write code with confidence. And that is true, but it is, it's worth complicating to some extent. Keep your eyes on the testing perimeter. This is my like funny little made-up term, and I'm try to illustrate. This. Let's say this is a some kind of fanciful map for your application and the things you've tested. Off in one corner is your domains, maybe your user classes, and over or here somewhere else is some controllers and stuff. And uh, you've got a couple of inner classes and so on and so forth. You're zipping around in that territory, feeling pretty good about yourself. Your bug rate isn't very is, is very low. Every time you refactor, it's a pretty easy thing to do, right? And then you kind of have to stretch out into some new territory, and this is what happens, right? I think, actually, it is worth noting that when you've been testing for a while, you may not notice it, but what ends up happening is that there's two kinds of code in your application, in your system. There's the stuff that's tested really well, and the stuff that's a giant pain in the ass to test. They're totally different to work on, right? And it's, you will probably always have it. But it's worth it to think about it, right? It's worth it to be conscious of it. When you're in the stuff, when you're inside the parameter, 
you, you can tear around really quickly, and you can just tear the guts out of stuff and refactor all the time. But like, you know, if you're running a Rails app and you have a ton of AJAX logic, and you know, testing JavaScript is just harder than testing Ruby code. You know, like when when someone comes along, it's like, oh yeah, I want to totally redo how this JavaScript logic works. You have to be more cautious, right? That's just the way it is. So you know, what's your testing perimeter? Right? The application you have and the team that you're part of, right? what layers are there that are harder for you to test for technical reasons? Right? What domain areas have you tested less for whatever reason? And what did you write in a hurry? Right? Because code lives, it, it, code is not without context. Right? Code gets written by human beings who are imperfect and sometimes decisions don't get made in the right way and then, you know. Dogma. More tests equals less bugs always. Um, again, this is worth complicating. <clears throat> less bugs per week or less bugs per feature? This is vaguely related to the thing I just said, right? Because when you're inside your well-tested area, you can just tear around really quickly, and the odds of you adding new bugs are very slim, right? But the faster you move, and if you're not paying attention, you can slip across the perimeter, so to speak, right? And so I think it's... There's, there's different ways to test. There's different things to prioritize on, right? So this is my fanciful formula. Testing is velocity times quality, right? So on the left-hand side, you have one way to do testing, which is as you have more testing, your features per week increases, but your bugs per week more or less stay the same. This actually happens. I've, I feel I've definitely seen this in, in, in projects and teams. Your code gets more and more solid. It does more and more things. But the number of times that your, your clients have to email you and say, hey, this one page, when you click on this link, it just breaks, stays more or less the same. Now, will your clients notice that you actually had less bugs per feature? Or are they more sensitive to bugs per, right? So these are these funny kinds of things about how the relationship works. On the, other, on the right-hand side, you're talking about actually having the same features per week but actually driving bugs down. So it's not about moving faster. It's not about putting things off the checkbox. It's about being rock solid. So if you work for NASA, you probably think this way, right? If you make pacemaker software, you're probably thinking that way, right? But if you're writing like some kind of social network tool that like plugs into Facebook and uses Flickr to send things through Twitter or whatever, like, right, like bugs per week is probably okay. Marking is the right day way to deal with test data. This is a big one. <clears throat> I've left about, I've tr I'm hoping to leave about 10 minutes uh, at the end of this talk for mocking proponents to yell at me. This is why I don't mock. Mocking focuses on services, but state is what matters. So let's kind of go through some terms. So, so mocking, as, as most of us understand in the testing community, is this idea that you will use surface calls, right? And, and this is pretty prevalent in RSpec. You can use it in, in a test unit and so on and so forth. This is uh, right from the RSpec documentation, right? So you're testing a, a per people controller, and then you're, you're saying, oh, the person class, let's not actually go through the person class of normal implementation, right? Let's intercept that call. Ruby's very dynamic. We can do this. And say, oh, when the person gets new, it should return this variable person, right? When person receives new, and then you have the should receive, and should receive create with name points to SLAC, right? This is right out of the RSpec doc, and this is probably... Uh, what a lot of people see when they first see mocking. Now, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an article that's actually a couple years old that's by Martin Fowler that's a really great introduction to sort of the breadth of this subject. It's called Mocks Aren't Stubs. And in it, he quotes Gerard Mazaros, who sort of has, breaks down kind of test doubles. That's anything that pretends to be anything else in a test context into four categories. So you've got dummies, and those are passed around but never used. So a lot of times you're dealing with fake objects inside of a parameter list. This doesn't really happen much in Ruby, but if you were writing some Win32 API, maybe, I don't know, right? Um, fakes, which actually work but are unsuitable in production. So there you're talking, SQLite, for example, is a pretty good example of a fake. It actually works, but you don't, you know, you don't deploy your Rails app with SQLite, or a lot of us don't. Uh, stubs provide canned answers to calls made during the test, may also record stateful information, so that's a little more stateful, and then mocks, which is showed. These are, these, the, the top three are kind of of one kind, and the bottom, and Mox is sort of its own, right? Uh, uh, the top three kind of care more about state. For example, there are ways that you could make two different kinds of call into the same stub or fake or whatever. You could do find or find by SQL on an active record thing, right? And if they actually return the same results, you don't care what was called. 
right? It's sort of the underlying results. It's not, whereas Mox is very much about the, you cut away individual layers, right? And this is exactly what it has to talk to on the layers below it. So Martin Fowler says, breaks it down into TDD class assists and TDD mock assists, right? So class assists use real objects whenever possible and then a double if it's awkward to use the real thing, any kind of double, really. And then a mockist will try to use mocks for any object with interesting behavior. So what you've got really is mockists to, the, the idea I think, and you know, you hope, I hope you can fr forgive me if I'm accidentally mischaracterizing p the position. But the idea with mocks really is that you're going to slice away your, your system into a bunch of discrete layers. You're going to really, every little part of it, you're going to wrap it in sort of, oh, this is the stuff that happens right above it, and this is the stuff that happens right below it, and you're trying to think of the controllers in isolation, the models, everything else, right? Class assist is much more sort of feature by feature. I'm going to write this one feature, I'm going to push it all the way down, in, in, you know, up and down each layer if I can. Now, I have a couple problems with mocking. Number one is I'm too dumb to think of the problem and the solution at the same time, and I feel like mocking really makes me do that. So let me, let me give you sort of an example. This is uh, from some code that hopefully is seeing public release on Monday. Uh, my company, Diversion, is working with Sling.com to make a site that uh, aggregates uh, professional video. It's very similar to Hulu in a lot of respects, so you have TV shows. Right, the office, so on and so forth, and then you have a show list page. Right, show me all the TV shows that are on this website. Now, it only makes sense to show a TV show if it has one video you can watch. Right, because really videos are the center of the website. This is not IMDb. Right, so we have a thing that says, okay, let's spec out the list page. Let's create a show. So this is the this is the classicist approach to it. This is how I do it. Right, create a show which is actually save it in a MySQL database. Right. Then create a video. Now it's dead. It was. It's. It's date dead. It's time now minus one hour. Right. So you could. You could watch it in the past. You can't watch it now. It expired. And then show update public videos count. That's some little cron thing or whatever. And then you get list and you say response body should not match. So the name of this show, some new sitcom, should not show up in the response body. Right. So that is a classicist approach in the sense of let's try to set up the entire universe in which this case might be interesting, and then we'll try to hit it and see what happens. This is a mockist approach, and this because this is actually what's happening inside this controller method. Show should receive find with all, select blah blah blah, conditions shows public videos count, and return empty array. That would be sort of be the mockist approach. Now, the, the the logically interesting thing is what's happening is conditions is shows public video count is greater than zero, if you want to break that out. But the other problem is that this select is in here. The reason this select is in here is because we've optimized this method. Right? Of course we've optimized this method. We're optimizing a ton of stuff. We're like totally paranoid about performance uh, at diversion. And what will happen is you'll write it first without that. And then at some point someone else will come along and optimize it and then this spec will break. Right? Because the surface call has changed even though rationally the exact same data, the exact same HTML got, got out. So that's why I have a problem with this kind of approach because you end up kind of binding on, on, on these fine grain layers. And here's the other thing. If you have a really tough bug that actually got onto, got onto production, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to write a, a test, a spec with mocks that captures the right layer call. We have video ingestion, so we actually take XML posts that say, oh, here's a new video from some syndication partner, CBS or Howcast or whatever, right? I introduced a bug into production early on that was not properly de-escaping. Right? So you can see this is a, a test that's like, we'll get an XML, right? and we'll put its title, single apostrophe, double quote, uh, ampersand, right? less than greater than. That's every single, those are, those are your core XML things that get escaped. And then I'm going to execute this ingestion post, and I should have a video as a result of it, and that video full title needs to be exactly that. right? No uh, ampersand APOS semicolon. Right? At the time I wrote this bug, first I see the ticket, or I see, you know, someone reports the bug to me, and then I start digging around. At the time I'm writing the spec, I have no idea what I did wrong. Why would I? Right? If I knew what I did wrong, I wouldn't have done it. Right? So, and, and somewhere in the guts of video ingestion posts, there's a RexML parser. Right? That's, and I did some wrong call. I, like, I, I called the wrong thing in XPath, or I used one method instead of another method. What the hell? Like, why am I supposed to have to think about this? when I'm actually, it's hard enough to actually capture the bug. So that's, I, I, you know, there's the difference between sort of black box testing and white box testing. I like black box testing primarily because it's, you know, I can sort of say, okay, right this minute, all I'm thinking about is the problem. And then I can sort of switch to the other side of the fence and say, okay, now I solve the problem I just wrote down. 
The other thing is that bugs can sneak in between layers. This is buggy code, but you won't know it. <coughs> if video has a make live method, and you're saying show should receive make video live then notify subscribers, and then below that you're actually testing make live and notify subscribers, you've introduced a bug, but these specs won't catch it. Right, because the layer of interaction is actually, the fact that show should receive will not actually do, do what it's supposed to do. You know, and, and so, this is, the, this is a question, right? Like, is that an interesting bug? I think it's interesting if it's gonna get out to production. So I'm a TDD classicist, you know, like Martin Fowler, actually. What does that look like concretely? That means every single time I'm writing tests in a Rails app or whatever, if it's in the database, I'm actually running a MySQL database in a test context, right? You don't do SQLite because if you end up having to do any optimization or any kind of specific stuff, then, uh, then, then SQLite isn't really gonna work out. And the fact of the matter is, I guess I'm a believer these days that like this idea of like complete database abstraction is like a bit of a, is a bit of a pipe dream. Unless you're actually writing something that never has to do anything hard in a database, um, then you should just go ahead and have that be bound up with your tests. And then when you do use test doubles, it's always a big deal. And you do from time to time, but it's, it's, it's never a light decision. So here's one. Ensuring that an optimization is being used. Videos come in from syndication partners and we get this ID from partner, right? Now, now this is not globally unique, right? This is a, but, but and, and the thing is also that it could be arbitrarily long. You'd like it if everyone was using numbers, but they're not. Sometimes you end up having to grab a URL or something like that. So we, we, this is not a varchar field. This is actually a text, right? Because one day in like six months, we could sign up some syndication partner. It turns out that all their IDs are actually 600 characters long, and the first 400 characters are the same. If you truncate it 255, you are like fucked beyond belief, right? Because you have 200 videos that all seem to be the same thing. So you make a text. Now here's the problem is that you have 100,000 videos, and if you have to look them up by this ID from partner field, it's very, very slow. So there's a bunch of pro ways you could do it. You could try to do different kinds of indexing inside of MySQL. But we decided to actually add a hash code field, right, which is an integer, right? So you'll take the partner ID and the ID from partner, you'll hash them together into an integer. You can look up by the integer, and that integer field is very indexable. It's a very fast lookup. Maybe you get one record. If you get three, then you iterate through and figure out which one you want, right? This is, this is kind of a, you know, this is what hash codes are really good for. This is kind of what it would look like on the video model, right? So you're saying, oh, this is the, pat this is the defined hash code function, right? Partner ID, ID from partner, put in a string, call dot hash on the end, you can hash anything, right? And then we're actually gonna write find by partner ID and ID from partner, and then we'll use the hash code in there. I left that logic out. But okay, so this, this will work, this will work just like find, uh, uh, find comma first blah 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 with conditions blah de blah. And so it's a different, it's a difficult challenge if you actually wanna test this. Because now you have two ways into the same data. They do the same thing, but one of them is just 100 times slower. So it's actually a good use for mocking, because you want to actually make sure, don't use this surface. It's slow as shit. Use this surface, which is faster, right? What's the way to do that? This is kind of how I ended up writing it. Um, it's, it's sort of like mocking. It doesn't use RSpec mocking, but I actually overwrote the find method and say, if you're calling find first with these various conditions, partner ID and ID from partner in there, I'm just gonna like freak out on you, right? So any test in the video ingestion post is gonna have a serious problem if you go through that one route. You basically like put a roadblock in there, right? So that's actually blocking a surface interaction, which is exactly how you wanna do it. Um, at the end, you have to do after all, and you have to remove that method. Uh, this, is, this is not easy to do, and I actually got it wrong the first time and broke everyone's test suite. Um, so, that's an example of why you would do that. Uh, and, you know, pretty hard. Right. Yes? Would that be a debate instead of a mock? Since you overrode it yourself? It, I think, I mean, the semantics are tricky, but I think it would be a mock because you're primarily concerned with surface interaction. And I'm not... Like, mocking isn't dependent on a specific library or syntax for actually doing the mock. It's really just, it's really just you can't get these results this way, because I, like, you can get them another way, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, you're calling super, so it is actually just blocking, sorry? Remember to repeat the question so members of the audience can hear. Yes, sorry. So he, he had asked, would that be a fake instead of a mock? 
So I think this still qualifies as a mock. Um, yeah, either way, it's, uh, it's a little bit of work to do. You don't do it all the time. You don't do it lightly. You know? Uh, yes? Um, can you take, um, can you simply say stub video dot stub refined and then return the actual mock up? I don't think the current, there's a bunch of different kind of mocking libraries. There's the one that's basically in our spec now, and I think there's a couple of people who are trying other approaches. I don't believe the current RSpec mocking library will give you a good way to do this because, in fact, this conditions, and, and the tricky thing is the conditions could be a lot of different things, and the fact, I'm just regexing it, right? So I don't think, and, 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 yeah, so I don't think the current RSpec mocking would give you a way to do that, but I wouldn't be, if, yes? Yeah, it, it won't because it won't actually call up the super at, at the end of it. Uh, okay. It completely replaces the method. So what what you're talking about is something called a test spy, uh, where you can actually have it call things, but you can either pay attention to what's called in the in the process, but it's still the real object in the real methods. And uh, people are talking about adding that to RSpec to uh, double R, and I haven't heard about double R. Did did everyone hear that? Okay. Um, yeah, if, if it were possible to do it with RSpec's uh, mocking as it is now, I wouldn't be opposed to it at all. Um, I, I, it's, yeah. The second example is faking an external web service, and this is like uh, insanely involved. Uh, but I'll, walk you, I'll try to walk you through it anyway. Slung.com has a RESTful member service that is not written by us. It's not written in Ruby. I've never seen the code for it. I have no control over how it's deployed. Right? It's just out there. Right? And, and it's, it's a kind of a single sign on sort of thing, which makes sense uh, it, when you're dealing with like, uh, uh, big organizations that might have a base of members that are shared across multiple applications. If you were working at Yahoo, you'd have the same problem. So we have Rails, and it can talk through this RESTful member service. It's, it ends up being a pretty complicated member service. So we end up writing a, a, a method, a class in between it, the member service class, which has all sorts of methods, authenticate, you know, member with email, member with pseudonym, blah, 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 um, that talk directly to the REST service on behalf of the, the rest of the application, right? Um, so they kind of, you're, you're wrapping all the restfulness in this one class. It's pretty complex, so you have a test on the side, you have member service test. This is a test unit example. It doesn't really change, uh, change it much. Um, okay, so you're going to have your rake test, right? Are you really going to run your member service test inside of your rake test? Are you going to have a test suite that, like, hits this RESTful thing every time you do it? Probably not. It's insanely slow. Member service test by itself maybe takes, like, four or five minutes to run. But the other problem is that since it's a database that we don't control, it could be down for a bunch of reasons. They could be in the process of deploying some experimental thing. They, incidentally, when we run on tests or in development mode, we're running against, obviously, not a, the production instance where they've got a staging kind of instance, right? So, but, you know, you don't want a situation where you, everyone else is working on totally unrelated stuff and, like, 20 of their tests break, and then I have to go, I am some guy, and he has to go, I am some guy, and look into it. Everyone stops working for a half hour, right? So you take it out. So, so our, our process is basically that you, only, you can run the member service test. It's standalone. It's not part of rake. And you don't run it all the time. You run it whenever you're touching that layer, right? Whenever you're adding another function or trying to refactor a thing in there, because it's a big deal and it's a, just sort of a pain, right? Um, and then, of course, you shouldn't be actually hitting the member service in the rest of your tests. There are actually a lot of other tests that, as a consequence of other things, go through login, forgot password, blah, blah, blah. So we ended up writing a member service stub, right, which is intended to basically f duplicate all of the functionality of member service. But obviously, it only lives within the Ruby process. Um, and it... it uh, it has lots of little back doors, which is what you end up writing in here, right? So you can say, oh, the next time you call anything on the member service stub, raise a connection error, because I want to see how my application handles it, right? Raise all these various errors and so on and so forth. You can sort of tune it and all these, you know, set it up in all these different ways. So it's underneath all the other stuff you're testing, but it can sort of like bubble problems up and you can try to catch them the right way. Problem is that the member service stub actually gets complicated too. So you write a member service stub test uh, which y you need because it's a complicated thing. Um, and, and that's, you can run that in your rake test because that's really fast and that's all inside of Ruby. It's not touching, touching any kind of rest. 
anything, right? And then the last step ends up being that you can sort of see that we've got on both the member service stub test and the member service test, you actually have common test methods. You have test can't update email through modify member, which actually makes sense, right? Because you have the member service and the member service stub. The member service stub is trying to look exactly like the member service. So in fact, a lot of the tests should be the same. So you break it out into a module, and now this is kind of what you're left with. You have these member service test cases uh, uh, methods. You have a couple of things that are unique off on the side, but a lot of it ends up being in this member service test cases file, which is defining most of it. I'm glad we did this work. I, I think in this case, there was a tremendous amount of complexity that we uh, were going to struggle with if we didn't sort of figure out how to wrap and abstract it. Um, but you know, there's no question, it was a tremendous amount of work. You know, I, and this is, this is the right way to do it. If you, if you try to not have a member service stub test, then you're exposed to actually having bugs in your member service stub that give you false positives, right? You think that your code works when it actually won't, when it runs against the real thing. Incidentally, did anybody here see me speak in RubyConf three years ago? Top to bottom testing? One person, two, three. Okay, a couple of people, all right. I, st I spoke about top to bottom testing and I talked, and I um, <clears throat> was talking about Lafcadio, which, an, which is an ORM I had written. Lafcadio's approach to testing was different and I believed differently then. I believe then you should have actually had, Lafcadio should have had a sort of a, I think it was like an object store stub or a mock object store or whatever, which actually when you wrote an application that included Lafcadio, when you ran it in test mode, it would sort of switch out and do this totally Ruby in memory thing that would never touch my SQL. And that, after wrestling with that for a while, I basically changed my mind. I think that was wrong because, because fundamentally, if you're going to have any kind of, you're never going to really be able to actually abstract away every little thing that a database does, and you should actually just let yourself drop into SQL, and then at that point, you, there's no, you can't run your tests against something that's non-SQL, basically, or non-MySQL or you know, specific to the environment you're in. So I just want to say for the record, I was wrong. Active Records approach was definitely better, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, I go in that direction now. And I, and I think it would be good if, you know, people on a regular basis would just get up and f speak in public and say I was wrong. I think we'd all be better off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll <don't> matter. <laughs> um, <clears throat> here's a dogma, and this is related to mocking, right, because people say, well, yeah, but I mean, if I run through the database for every single test I've got, then everything's going to take a long time. And this is the dogma everyone's always talking about. If your tests don't run quickly, there's something wrong with you. You personally are at fault. <laughs> you are not being virtuous enough, right? You haven't stuck to the religious line closely enough. Your faith is in doubt. I also like a pony. You know, I. <laughs> yes. If I could, I would have my test run in less than 30 seconds. That would be awesome. That would just be great. But given the trade us I've got, I'm going to just stick with tests that take a while, but help me out in other ways. So let me, let me take a poll of the room. Who here works on the main application where the test suite takes more than one minute to run? All right. More than two minutes. OK, more than five minutes. So even more than five minutes, you got maybe, what, a third of the room, a quarter of the room? Okay. I'm here to tell you today that you are okay. <laughs> that you're still good at what you do for a living. I'm here to, I'm here to spread a message of love and acceptance and tolerance, and I want to thank you all for coming out of the closet with me as I let you know that my tests take a little longer than I would like. Um, how often do you run the tests? <laughs> Sorry? If the test takes so long, how often do you run them? Uh, I try to run them basically. What, what ends up happening at our company is that people sometimes kind of use their own, this is not ideal. So I'm not saying we're, I'm not saying we're at the promised land yet. But what often happens for us is people say, well, if there's a bunch of stuff going that I've done or merges coming in that make me suspect, I'll run the whole thing and wait. But if it's some little tiny thing, I'm just going to try to by hand run just a couple of files and then check in and hope. Probably we should be doing some continuous integration thing with that, but that, that helps to some extent, but that doesn't really fix the problem, you know? But, but yeah, so that's what we're doing now. It's not perfect. Yes? Uh, one thing I noticed that was helpful is if the tests start taking five minutes and you 
use auto test, it wouldn't matter anyways. Auto test will rerun any test related to code that changed, and then it runs in the background, and then you don't feel it. Like right. The error happens, it just pops in your face. So, so this young man is advocating auto test. Hey, Ryan, are you here? I'm here. Okay. No. Well, okay, Eric, you can beat me up for Ryan. I don't use auto test. You jerk. Do you want to? <laughs> and it's. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't like Ryan or Eric. I like you guys a lot. Um, it's because I find that if I'm writing a whole system-wide thing, auto test, no computer program is going to be smart enough to figure out, oh, you changed this model, but actually you're doing it to support this thing on a controller, so on and so forth. So my experience, I've tried it a couple of times, and my experience is that auto test doesn't really work with the way I want to write tests. You can change it. OK. <laughs> Maybe we we'll, we can talk about this later. Maybe I just haven't properly dedicated. Actually, after it passes, it reruns all tests. But if it sure. doesn't pass, that's when it just reruns the last test that was failing. So right. it does make sure that you, there's no ripple effect, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for whatever reason, I've, it's it's been extremely hard for me to get auto tests to work with. A lot of my workflow actually ends up being this, which is which is I'll write some very top level sort of integration e test or whatever that explains kind of this very top level story of like, well, if I enter forgot my password, and I get this email, then I click on the link, and then I forget whatever and stuff. I'll run that. That fails on the first step. That's fine. That's like some 40 line test. Hopefully, you know, hopefully less than that. Then the next thing is, oh, I need to write a thing on a model to, maybe I need to tweak auto test. But then I need to write a thing on a model to support this thing that I haven't even hooked into it yet. So I write the thing on the model. It seizes the change and runs the integration test again. Of course it broke. So, it, it, yeah, it depends on your testing style. For whatever reason, uh, many people I know have. Just kind of to support your point that you can buy tests that run slow and with auto tests it wouldn't be a big deal. That's okay. Uh, All right. Trying to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's I'm glad. working out for you, and I, I'm sure it's working out for other people because a lot of people use auto test. So. Um, yeah, it's it's only natural I think that tests are going to run long, and at a certain point, right? Like if your application is actually big enough which is often a sign that it was vaguely successful in its early stages, it's just going to take a while, like, right? Rubinius' tests don't run in less than 30 seconds. That's because it, right? Yeah, it does a lot of stuff. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, I think it's also worth noting, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and be optimistic about sort of new efforts to use, uh, you know, homebrew parallelism to fix this. Dever is this very early stage. Are any of the Dever guys here, actually? Yeah, right. There was some early stage uh, Rails-y startup that is trying, and they're very alpha, and their stuff could be totally vaporware, actually. But what they say they're going to do is they're going to set you up with basically having your code repo hooked up into an EC2 cluster. So as soon as you want to run a test suite or something, it'll get all the code changes out on maybe 10 machine, 10 instances or whatever, and run them in parallel, which makes perfect sense because tests are supposed to be isolated anyway, right? They should be parallelizable. Right? And they have written on their blog, they have their first alpha customer, they got someone whose tests took, what is it, yeah, 40 minutes down to two minutes. Right? So if Dever, Dever or another company may bring this to us, but this makes perfect sense to me. Cloud computing is getting easy and blah, blah, blah. So this is a, this is a parallelizable problem, so we will attack this in the next couple of years. Also, it's worth noting Brian, hey, Brian, are you here? Brian Helmkamp? Sorry. I think it's probably more than one. And maybe Brian's not here. Brian Helmkamp's working on a thing called Testure, which does the same thing sort of locally. That's more like you buy a couple of Mac Minis, maybe five or ten, and put them in the closet. They listen over Bonjour and try to grab stuff, and so it's, a, it's the same sort of thing. I think there's no question a lot of wrinkles will have to be worked out, but in theory, I think the idea is very compelling. There's a lot of future there. So here's another dogma, which, has, which is vaguely related to the mocking thing, which is your code should always be well-structured. And, and, and I hope this doesn't get me fired saying this in public, but I don't believe that's the case. Understructuring can be an agile practice, and good tests can help you get there. So what do I mean when I say that? <clears throat> this is a diagram I kind of cribbed from Lean Software Development by Mary and Tom Poppinger. Uh, great, great book, by the way. Um, you know, and, and, and the core, one of the things that started allowing Agile to be a, actually a legitimate, you know, an, an easy, any possibly even one day mainstream practice in our business is the fact that cost of change is going down for so many things. There are many, many decisions that you could change later on. They won't be that much more expensive, right? So, and then, and then there's changes in high streak constraints, right? So you have to isolate which decisions are expensive to change later and make them early and make them right. 
So using a database is actually, you know, if you want to try to switch from MySQL to Oracle in the middle of a project, that's going to be really painful. So, you know, early on, you're making a commitment to that. But you're not making a commitment to, like, oh, what do we name this model? Do we do this with a Boolean field or an enumerated? No, no, right? You don't care about that stuff. So the, the great thing about Agile is that you, most things are on that lower curve, right? The cost of change does not go up much over time. But the other thing is that it is an agile practice to try to push as many things as possible from that higher curve down to that lower curve, right? If you can say more and more things are okay for us to defer, then that's a good thing. And I think, actually, uh, being a TDD classicist helps me do that. It, if you sort of imagine a fanciful blog post controller that's creating a blog post and then maybe it's doing something, incrementing some count or doing whatever on a user and also on tags, this might be, this is sort of a very, a uh, quick and dirty sort of visualization of what that would look like in a, in a mocked way, which is you're testing all the layers in isolation, right? So you've got the tests on the blog post controller, you've got should receive, so you're not actually touching the blog post. You have tests on the blog post, and you've got should receive, so you're not touching the user in the tag. But if you have to refactor this really heavily, you have to drag your tests along with you, right? Because you have encoded, you've t taken time to encode the, the layer interactions into every single sort of part of your stack, right? Now, if it looks like this, maybe you don't have that problem. And this is kind of how I like to think of things, which is let's think of the surface of things, which is probably HTML and web requests in a Rails app. I mean, if you, if you want to go even further, you can do sort of a, a web testing, Selenium, whatever kind of thing. Um, but, you know, you do this and you just test the hell out of the top thing, right? And then below it, maybe you have a lot more freedom to move things around as you discover it. A lot of this, I think, comes down to what kind of work do you get and what kind of domains are you working in, right? So this is why I said I get put a lot on very complex domains, to, which, which is to say I get them wrong the first time, right? And I get put on domains where, where they shift, which is to say that sometimes the customer doesn't really know what they want, but you still have to grope your way forward anyway, right? So in, in those times when, when naming things is even really hard, uh, I like to, 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 to have my tests feel more like this, right? I'm gonna do the, the very top level thing, I'm gonna specify the living shit out of it. And everything else, I'm gonna be able to slide it around. <clears throat> I like to make an analogy which is having to do with your apartment. This is a, a Flickr photo from a complete stranger, I just looked it up. Um, someone who lives in Manhattan, in New York City, those of you who've been to New York City know that real estate is insanely expensive and people will live in very small places so they can live near all these beautiful restaurants and bars and stores and so on and so forth. This is someone's home office, I think in, uh, I think in Greenwich Village. And uh, it's, it looks very nice, I gotta say, but it's, it's very precise, right? Everything kind of has a, a place for it. Because when you don't have a lot of space, you really need to be precise about it. I lived briefly with two friends of mine in a very, very, very small apartment in the East Village. It probably was big enough for one person. There were three of us in there. This is, not, this is common in Manhattan. And my one friend said, God, I feel like all I do here is put things away. <laughs> right? Because it was true. You didn't, have, you didn't have the space to fuck around, right? You leave your coat out, and then your roommate's like, oh my god. Right? So here's where I live now. This is my home office now. It's in Brooklyn. It's four stops out. It takes me a half hour or 20 minutes to get to Union Square, maybe 45 minutes to get to the Lower East Side. But I have a ton of space, which means that if I want to leave a corner of the room messy for a week or even a month, I can just do it. It's awesome. You know? So, obviously, I've made my trade-offs. Now, now this, you know, I do kind of wish I could live in Manhattan, but so it goes. Um, I think of that as an analogy with coding. I like, this is the trade-off I want to make. I want to test the hell out of the top layer and go to, go to more work to do it so that I have room to make other, dis I don't have to constantly clean up after myself when it's not that important. Here's another dogma. Fine grain focus leads to high quality code. And I think this is something that we, we, we see a lot sort of in testing literature, because it's all about let's get the smallest thing possible, right? So maybe this is veering outside of the subject of testing, but I feel like it's worth talking about anyway. Never forget the unknown unknowns. And for this, we're gonna try to see if you can, hold on. Can you hear that? That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. Okay. Did you, you hear that? Okay. <clears throat> Now, Donald Rumsfeld is a maniac, and they should never put him in charge of a war. But, <laughs> but he's on to something. 
right? Which is which is sort of the nature of how you know things, basically. Um, some and actually, the thing he's talking about comes from this philosopher Karl Popper, who I don't know. Does anyone here actually? All right, all right. So Karl Popper was really into the philosophy of science and epistemology, which epistemology is literally the philosophy of how you know that you really know a thing, right? Um, and although, although Rumsfeld's sort of echoing Popper, Popper also comes up a lot among some hardcore hedge fund guys. George Soros talks about him all the time, and so does Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Now this was uh, a really big pop science book that came out, I think, two years ago, The Black Swan. It's actually awesome, and I don't read a lot of pop science, actually. Um, the black swan is these idea, the idea of highly improbable, unimaginable things coming in and sort of how you know they're not going to happen. Karl Popper did he, did, he said, you can observe the existence of a thousand white swans, but, you, but that does not disprove, that does not prove that black swans don't exist. And after he said it, years after he said it, they discovered black swans when they discovered Australia. So, you know, Taleb is actually... The, the funny thing is, Taleb's book is all about sort of the arrogance of thinking you know things, but he's an astoundingly arrogant writer, and he's like really into telling everyone else they're an idiot, but it's actually a great book. One of the things, he, he mostly talks about finance and hedge funds and so on and so forth, but he's talking generally about statistics. One of the things he talks about is going to a risk management conference that's hosted at a casino in Las Vegas, right? And thinking about what major risks does a casino face, right? There's luck everywhere. There's this roulette and blackjack and poker and God knows what, right? And how much money could you lose that? So someone who was like a major risk management person at a casino told him, well, these are the four events. Here are four events that either A, cost casinos a huge amount of money or came close to costing them, right? Number one, Roy Horn was mauled by a tiger. It cost the casino $100 million in medical fees, uh, refunds, lost reservations, so on and so forth. They weren't even insured for it. They, they were, because Siegfried and Roy had lived with these tigers for years, and everybody thought it was completely absurd. They had insured against the audience members being attacked by a tiger, but they didn't insure against their performers. Because how could that possibly happen? It would never happen. And it happened. Number two, a disgruntled contractor planned to dynamite basement pillars. He was injured on the job. He was extremely unhappy with his compensation settlement, so he actually got his hands on dynamite and blueprints of the building and was planning to you know, basically bring the whole thing down. Now they caught him, so nobody was hurt. Uh, so the cost is really zero, but even so, it's a sort of thing. Right? Now he writes taxes. Huh? <laughs> now he writes taxes. Um, three. For years, an employee neglected to mail certain casino-specific tax forms to the IRS. And this person wasn't even trying to commit an act of fraud. This person was just flaky. And it was this, per, this employee's job to actually just put it in the mail and make sure the IRS got it. And instead, they just put it in a drawer for years. And so when they discovered it, actually, they had to pay this massive, massive fine, undisclosed fine, to the IRS so they could keep their license to allow gambling at all. And the fourth one was that an executive's daughter was kidnapped, and he tried to pay the ransom out of company funds. What's, <clears throat> what's interesting to consider about these things is that none of them involve a guy getting really lucky at craps, right? None of them get involve a guy getting really lucky at roulette. And we, you know, we're all like hardcore math nerds, so we love this idea that, oh, yeah, if you roll a seven, blah, 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 you're out of da, 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 right? You, uh, I mean, we all learned that. We learned it in our first year of CS. We learned it playing Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> whatever, right? And, but, but there is a certain amount of, uh, of, of validity that is going to fall outside of kind of what is stated rules, right? So I, I think, I think it's, it's just important as we're testing, unit testing or whatnot, to not lull, lull ourselves into a false sense of security. Somebody has to think about weird failure states. Somebody has to think about unknown unknowns, which is not, not a science, the furthest thing from a science. So these are kind of like intro systems design issues, right? How likely is failure? What will it look like? How can I find about it quickly and how can I limit its damage, right? If you have a cron that runs once a day and then all of a sudden it breaks for some completely random ass reason, are you going to figure it out right away? Or is it going to sit there for two weeks totally unnoticed? When you do notice it, will you have lost data permanently or can you recover easily from it, right? And, and it's funny because to think about these kinds of issues requires a sort of a perverse imagination. Right? And, and you have to plan for failure, but nobody actually plans to fail. So 
uh, but but it's just you know it's important for us to not lull ourselves into a false sense of security. Testing, automated testing, is awesome for a very specific subset of our jobs, but it's not the only thing we do. So you can't solve all of our problems. Let's get to my last point, which is testing makes my job easier, which is probably true. Testing makes it easier for others to do my job unless my job keeps growing. We, we work in a competitive field, and it changes all the time. Uh, most of us were not writing Ruby five years ago. Some of us were. You know? And so it's, it's definitely, you know, and continuing to think about where we're going with our careers and what different kinds of problems, how those fit into our careers, right? You sort of imagine a 1998.com or whatever, maybe this is how much effort their tech, this is obviously a very fanciful graph. This is how much effort their, you know, the technical staff spends on various aspects of putting up a website. Again, the simplest business logic was a pain in the ass. Those of you who were around, you know, those of you who have been programming for 10 years will know, like, and especially Rails has really, like, just nailed this, right? With, with Active Record and getting all the stuff, and it's great. But it's not like the pie itself necessarily shrinks. It just, the, the pieces shift around, right? Who here knows more about systems administration than they did five years ago? You know why you know more about systems administration? Because the domain logic part of your job got so small that it got, it's like less than a full-time job. Right? So there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's actually awesome. It's really, really great. But we, we can't lull ourselves into a sense of security and thinking, well, the domain logic part is just like really, really easy. Right? There's actually, you, you need to be stretching out into the parts that are harder, even if they're hard to test. So if, you, if that system design sort of on the left, complex business logic, which is Testable, but harder. You know, I feel like you've got to go there, right? Because you have to stay big, you know, even if the business logic goes small. Um, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. I, I, I'm, I'm, there must be someone with a question or a comment. Yes, please. Yeah, when you're talking about the uh, fine-grained approach in the unknown unknowns, doesn't a fine-grained approach to a certain extent help you eliminate unknowns that you may not know about? For example, if you have 10 lines of code, and you have a test that, tends, that tests supposedly all 10 lines of those code. There's 10 lines there where something that you never anticipated could go wrong. But if you test every individual line on its own with its own tests and take a look at it and, and delve into what could possibly go wrong with each line, then you have a much better chance of, of covering an unknown that you may, didn't even know was there to begin with. Did, did everyone hear what you said? Do I, should I repeat it? Okay, so it's, it's about sort of whether or not you the unknown unknowns thing. You can kind of capture it with lots of little fine grain tests, even on every little line. I would say a lot of times you can't, because you end up, I mean, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but I feel like a lot of times when you write tests, you end up saying, here's these preconditions. The website, the database is in this state, or the model is in this state. Now I'm going to call this method on it, right? Any non-trivial application is going to have lots of different states. And you're automatically always thinking about, oh, it could be in this state or this state or this state. I'm going to cover all of them, so on and so forth. If it gets into a state that you didn't even imagine, then, then it's sort of worth asking, you know, to what extent, to what extent does it hold up? You know, I, I, I think, I, unfortunately, I'm not able to come, come here with any grand uh, recommendations as you sort of how you handle that, because, because I don't think I'm an expert at it at all. But I sort of feel like, like, the, the, if, if the fine-grained, there's, there's definitely a lot of times where the sort of fine-grained approach to unit testing and so on and so forth is very good for nailing down this very specific, oh, I'm going to treat the string this way, I'm going to parse it or whatever, I'm going to extract this port from this host on this string, URL string, these kinds of things. But when you're trying to think of the whole, you can't actually keep all the combinatorial policy, possibilities of the whole uh, 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 application in your head. And in fact, most of them you dismiss outright because they're invalid and you can't imagine how they got that way. I think, I think, but I do think there's a sort of like a, a process of training yourself instinctively to know like, well, this is probably rock solid, but this thing, I don't know. Do I need to write these sort of like other layers of cascading failure handling? Oh yeah, what if the queue backs up? What if, right? There's, there's some things where it's like, oh, I'm just parsing a string, it's gonna be awesome. You know? And there's some things, and, and knowing how those things can change and break over time is very tricky. Eric. Heckle can help with the thing that you wanted to do that does mutation testing. Right, right. So, yeah, so yeah. have all. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned preferring uh, um, testing in a classist way. Uh, I think that's the equivalent of unit testing and functional testing. You're testing straight through to the database. 
on a black box level than by testing the individual unit. But, uh, yeah, it could be. It, it's tricky because the term functional test has been abused a bit. Uh, okay, but, all right. but, but yeah, I mean, some people do functional tests that way, yes. One of the problems I've actually had in just testing out the functionality is like when I'm talking to a payment gateway, for example, a lot of times the payment gateway's test gateway doesn't actually match up with the test gateway, with the production payment uh, gateway system. And right. so I actually have to use a mock because it's the only way I can actually replicate the production data that we're actually getting because the yeah, production data, you know, the production system actually has bugs, or the test data is the test data is actually not it's not being able to replicate all of the states that we need. So what do you do in situations where you don't really have full control of the environment? Or you don't so, know what you're so, so to repeat his point, he was saying that he has, he's had difficulties, for example, where you have a payment gateway and the actual production payment gateway actually acts differently than the testing gateway. In an ideal world, you'd be able to email them and be, and be like, test your fi test gateway, fix your test gateway, dude? But of course, no. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that stuff is really hard. The, the, the problem, part of the problem with the sorts of things, you know, depending kind of who, who's the person on the other side of the phone, right? Like, if they really know the thing and they can describe all these, these interactions to you very concretely and correctly, then I think it's easier to write out a stub or whatever. And certainly a payment gateway is the sort of thing that you do really want to stub out all the time. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not an ideal situation, certainly. Uh, yes? Hey. You, uh, do you use firing key constraints in your database when you're testing? And does that slow things down because you have a lot of dependencies to create before making each of your admins? So Ben was asking if we use foreign key constraints, if I use foreign key constraints in my testing and if it slows things down. I don't, but I do actually try to sort of, you end up creating, creating this cluster of objects. This is sort of like the object mother pattern that people talk about. So not, it's not a database thing. It ends up being your active record validations. It's kind of the same thing to some extent. Um, it does slow you down. I don't know. I, 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 for whatever reason, I don't think it's such a big deal. I think it's actually, you know, maybe this is a stupid way to put it. I think it's actually virtuous to be forced to write an extra six lines and say, this is how the, the system would get into the state by which this case is interesting. You know, I, I think that's actually a useful mental exercise. Like, it's a little, it's a little bit of busy work, certainly. And then what ends up always happening whenever you do this is you always have these sorts of like. Uh, you know, quick convenience things where like make me a user, it'll be the same as the other user, but the name will be different. These sorts of things, and and certainly there's a lot of like libraries out there where people are trying to like get exactly the right way to you know a really good way to do that. That's that's still a frothy area of inquiry. I think I think there's a lot of stuff happening and things are changing really quickly. I haven't seen anything that I'm totally in love with yet. I kind of do my own thing, but uh, yeah. Yes. I had a question about the slide where you were showing us how you like to write. Most of the tests against the controller. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like bringing it back. There. So I usually like that approach because I start with the controller without having any of the models. I write the test against them. I don't have to think about the design yet. I can put all of the implementation in the controller for all I care at first. And then I gradually refactor and create blog posts and then user and then tag. One uh, roadblock that I've run across a few times is sometimes in the future I decide I need to reuse blog posts in a completely different context with a different controller. Yet I don't want to repeat all the tests that I have for this controller that are covering the blog post functionality in the second controller. So what's one way to deal with this? Do I have so to repeat your point, you're saying that you kind of do like this sort of approach, but then sometimes you end up finding that you came in somewhere else and you have the blog post and you have a bunch of repeated functionality. There is definitely, I think, sort of a, a, a bit of a, a, a de delicate dance where you're like, actually, you know what? The blog post thing is becoming real, like really solid. Like I know what this is. Everyone on the team knows what this is. Let's, let's just cram a bunch of unit tests on it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know? If the domain is extremely well understood, and you feel like it's not going anywhere, then yeah, just like bang. Just like, yeah, write a kajillion test on the blog post. I think it depends on sort of the problem you're trying to solve. So in that case, I would say what ends up happening is you're going to have two things. You're going to move some of those tests down to unit tests. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I also would say that in the process of, like, if you write this first, and in fact, you never created a blog post model, which is sometimes how I end up doing it. You create a blog post model. That lives in the code, and people look at it for a little while. Um, it's completely legit to say, okay, you know what? Like, 
The, one of these controller tests tests how this method works on blog posts in, implicitly. I've got a couple little edge cases I want to really get solid. You just add them to the, to the model or test them directly on the model. There's nothing wrong with that. If, you know, it, it, it's all on like a, it's a case by case basis, right? If you feel like your classes and your methods and your interfaces are really solid, if you really like how they sound to you and everyone knows what they mean, then, then yeah, just like wrap them up, right? They're done, which is great. But, but just as often there's code that you get out there and you're like, oh, I don't really, this isn't, this isn't, this is not the best way to express it. I can't think of a better way right now. But I'm just going to push it out some more. Trotter. So, um, I, I think though that what you got here is slightly misleading because I think that what ends up happening is yes, you have a lot of tests on blog post controller, but you should really have a lot of tests on blog post. But I think the key here is that you've removed all the mocking in between. So it's fine to have a lot of tests on blog post. It's good to have a lot of tests on blog post, a lot of tests on user, a lot of tests on tag. That makes sense. But when you go, when you get excessive with your mocking, then you have these weird issues and it becomes kind of, if you really Should actually, this this test is probably, you should probably have a couple more tests on the mock on the models below it. Yeah, I, I might agree. I mean, obviously, it's a fanciful. It's just a bunch of floating boxes and an omnigraph set. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, please. Um, to play the mocking devil's advocate, when you uh, do a black box test and something explodes, you don't know where it is. Whereas if you're slicing it by layers using mocks, you usually use pinpoints. Uh, do you have any practices that go along with your to help isolate those problems? So, so, so the point he's making is that when you do this sort of black box testing without mocks, and one thing sort of in a low layer breaks for whatever you change something and it broke, you might actually create 20 errors all at once, which, which is absolutely true. Um, do I have any practices? I guess I don't have anything more sophisticated than just saying I like digging through the code. You know, I mean, I, maybe that sounds ludicrous, but but I I, I still think that's okay. I kind of like. I mean, you know, I like the idea also that you kind of there's certain smells of oh, if five controllers broke at once, it's probably in some common code, right? But that's not a huge help. I just think that um, I don't know. In my experience, that's not that much of a cost. But maybe I'm a freak that way. I don't know. Yes, please. Um, and the problems that a lot of people experience, like what you were describing, it's, it's helpful to understand that, that the way we use mocks today evolved out of extreme programming. And so you start with customer acceptance tests, which are end-to-end -end tests. That, so you've got that high level of coverage that you're talking about right now that you're getting at a slightly lower level. Uh, so you, you end up not really running into the same kinds of problems where you might be mocking a certain method and you change the method elsewhere and now those things don't align because they'll show up in your end-to-end -end tests. That's right. That's right. Uh, and, and one other thing, if I might add, it's also the original intent of it was as a design tool. The point is that I'm working on this class right here and it's got to use this other class that doesn't exist yet. So I'm just going to put in this thing and tell it how to interact with that class that doesn't exist yet. And now, A, I can focus on the thing I'm doing now, and B, I design in part the API of the other thing that doesn't exist yet. So, yeah, and I think did, did people hear the uh, second point there? Kind of about how you can, you can think in layers in isolation and you can if I'm characterizing it right, you can sort of test one layer without actually having to implement the next thing and sort of know that that's correct. Um, yeah, and I think there, there is sort of a, a you know, I don't, I don't have any doubts that people who practice mocking are good at what they do. And, and you know, so th I think there is actually maybe a very core philosophical difference, which is I don't, and, and, and Martin Fowler talks about it in his essay, which is that, you know, people who are mockist, people who do mockist TDD tend to like to think of their, uh, he said they, you know, they, they think of their code sort of in layers, right? And they want to focus on one layer and then fix the layer below it and stuff, whereas sort of the classicist kind of actually thinks in terms of one narrow feature that goes all the way down. Um, I, I think that, and you know, it, it's going to depend on a lot of things, sort of how your head likes to work probably and probably how the team communicates about d domain design and stuff. I actually like, like moving, like, stumbling forward in this weird soup of classes that may not have quite the right name yet or may meet another sort of inner, inner class or some intermediary class to like solve some complicated calculation. I actually think 
Like, I, feel, I personally feel okay about that. Now, maybe that's weird. But, yeah. I, I don't want to convince you to change your practice. I just wanted to put some context around why mocking is the way it is and, and that it can actually be used very effectively, but there is some pieces that have to be in place and a, a mindset that has to be in place. I think um, I made him look way over. It's like, it's 6.15. So I'm just going to cut it. I think we have to go eat. But uh, thanks again, everyone.